Good morning. Welcome to the New Troy Grace Brethren Church on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. Truly, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We want to welcome all of you out there in Internet land on Facebook and YouTube. And again, extend a special invitation to you to sometimes stop in and see us and, and worship and fellowship with, if, with us in a live service. Every Sunday morning here at 11 o'clock, uh, here in the corner, here in New Troy. A few announcements I need to highlight. Uh, we got some more information on little baby Gus Joubert. He's scheduled to go in tomorrow morning, that's Monday morning, about 10 o'clock. Uh, he's going to have to have another open heart surgery, and this time to repair his tricuspid valve. Um, and hopefully they can repair that and this will help stave off renal failure. He's really been having problems with his kidneys and they're hoping that this will help, help alleviate that problem. Continue to remember our dear brother, Pastor Davy Troxel, as he continues to recover. Uh, Howard Bennett, down there in Mississippi, still having some health issues. And our own uh, Pastor Ron Welsh and his wife Donna. And my cousin Florence uh, Castle, I still haven't heard otherwise, so I assume she's still struggling with pneumonia. So please keep these dear saints in your prayers, shall you? All right, I think that's all the announcements I need to highlight at this time. So before we get into the word this morning, let's have an opening word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you again for this beautiful Lord's Day that you have given us. I just pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit would pervade this very um, auditorium. We know you have promised where two or three are gathered in your name that you are in the midst, and we claim that this morning. And I pray above all that your Holy Spirit would hide me behind the cross, that uh, you would uh, anoint my lips, anoint our ears and our hearts, that as the message goes forth this morning, it will go forth in the power and might of your Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Lord. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Well, this morning, we are back in Revelation, and we're beginning, or finishing up chapter 3. We're looking at the message, or the letter to the church at Laodicea. Before we get into that, though, I want to share this short story with you. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a heavenly story. God is talking to one of his angels and says, do you know what I have just done? I have just created a 24-hour period of alternating light and darkness on earth. Isn't that good? The angel says, yes. But what will you do now? God says, I think I'll call it a day. Yeah, groan. That was a Pastor Art McCrum joke. He told a lot of those that would make you groan. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you this morning. If you haven't already turned there, please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to finish up chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 through 22. The message to the church in Laodicea. And John writes this, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. 
and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. John really unloaded on this church at Laodicea through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've entitled my message this morning, The Neutral Church. The Neutral Church. First of all, we want to look at the character of the city of Laodicea. Um, this is the last of the seven letters to the churches. Um, this one to the church at Laodicea, a city 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and almost 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was a very wealthy trade center, and the church members at Laodicea shared in that wealth. Outwardly, the church at Laodicea was the most impressive of the seven, but spiritually it was the most distressing of all. Because of its worldly success, the church had become indifferent to its real spiritual need. The compromising neutrality and self-centeredness of Laodicea is characteristic of great numbers of so-called evangelical churches today. And they, like the church at Laodicea, need to be called back to belief in true creationism and true biblical authority and to belief in Jesus Christ as the true creator and faithful witness. Now Jesus describes himself to the church at Laodicea. You know, in one sense, Laodicea was a better church than Sardis. It was at least lukewarm. But Sardis seemed cold and dead. Yet, the Lord says he would rather it be cold like Sardis. In modern terminology, a church of dead orthodoxy is better than one of prosperous but neutral evangelicalism. The Laodicean church was not one of complete apostasy. Its lampstand had not been removed, and the Lord was still in the midst of the lampstands. It was not cold to the vital truths of God, his creation, his word, but neither would it take a firm stand and proclaim a true witness. And Christ amazingly said, if they could not be hot, he would rather see them cold. Then he goes on to tell them what he knows about this church of Laodicea. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ was the same as any other man. He could either enjoy a hot drink or a cold drink. But no one wants a lukewarm or tepid drink. And his determination to cast out such a church was not final. There was still room for repentance and revival, but the situation was grave. And he lets them know if they did not change their ways, he would spew or spit them, as the NASB says, spit them out of his mouth. I've heard some use the term vomit out of his mouth. Very, very gruesome, horrible way to express that. But that's how bad it was. You know, the number of such churches today is overwhelming. And they are a greater hindrance to the cause of Christ than if they were cold and dead. Furthermore, they bitterly resent hot churches and do all they can to cool their enthusiasm and dilute their convictions because they are a rebuke to their own lack of doctrinal conviction and missionary zeal. 
Now Jesus wants to know what he has against them. Jesus is very uncomplimentary about the church of Laodicea because they felt they were rich and in need of nothing. But Jesus said they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now many Bible commentators on these verses have come out of such neutralist churches and therefore apply this passage to modernist and apostate churches where the inspiration of the scriptures, the virgin birth of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, and other basic doctrines are openly denied and repudiated. Blatantly liberal churches are not churches at all in the biblical sense. They have no lampstand and Christ is not in their midst. It is the neutral churches here of which Christ speaks. Such churches commonly call themselves conservative or evangelical or charismatic or even fundamentalist and may have big buildings, excessive, uh, ostentatious displays of programs and so on. But if they do not stand solidly for true creationism and full biblical inerrancy and authority in all things, Christ, who is the creator and the word, finds them intolerable and threatens to spit them out. Now he lets them know what he wants them to do. Jesus wants them to recognize their wretched condition and come to him in repentance, forsaking their riches and prestige for the true riches, that is faith tried in fire, and their worldly wisdom for true wisdom in Christ. And they must receive pure white garments to replace the filthy rags of their own righteousness. The scriptures tell us that our own righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in God's sight. And they need ISAB for their spiritual blindness so that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him and that their understanding will be enlightened. They think they see, they think they know, but he says you're blind and naked, miserable. Then he goes on, and this is a controversial verse. He tells them that he is standing at the door and knocking, waiting for them to open the door so he can come in and have communion or dine with them. I think the authorized version says that he would come in and sup with them. This verse has often been misinterpreted as a salvation verse. It is not. This is Jesus standing outside of a lukewarm church, knocking to get in, and they are ignoring him. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Wow. Now, I will agree that, that um, you could apply this, in a sense, to uh, Jesus knocking on the door of someone's heart asking if he would allow, they would allow the Holy Spirit to come in. But that was not what this verse was intended to be understood as when John wrote it. Also, in this phrase here, he is referring to his imminent return to earth, where one day he will literally dine with his people at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. This is looking forward to that. Oh my, my heart yearns for the day when the Lord will call his church out of this world and we will go to be with him and rule and reign with him forever and ever. And uh, wow, that's gonna be a red letter day. Then he goes on to a promise of a reward. He promises to him that overcomes, he says, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Whoa. 
This is an amazing manifestation of grace because he is just talking about one who he was about to spit out of his mouth and now he has invited him to sit with him on his throne. You know, it's interesting when the mother of James and John went to Jesus and she said, uh, Master, would you grant me uh, a wish? He says, uh, what would you like? She says, well, when you, when you uh, come in your kingdom, may my sons sit on your right hand and on your left hand in your kingdom. <laughs> and Jesus looked at her and he says, you don't know what you ask. And then he looked at James and John. He said, are you ready to drink of the, of the uh, cup of, of uh, torture and, and all this that he was uh, gonna go through? And they said, yes, we are. And uh, James was killed with a sword he was, by Herod. He was the first martyr. And John was attempted to be uh, boiled in oil by Emperor Domitian, but uh, God supernaturally uh, intervened and John was spared so he could write this book of the Revelation. You know, it's also, he said, also, he said, what you're asking is not mine to give. He said, that is reserved by my father alone. So it will be interesting in the kingdom to see who sits on his right hand and two on his left. Notice again that all seven of the promises to the overcomers involves features that are mentioned again in the description of the ages to come, where all will be fulfilled. Thus, the tree of life was promised to Ephesus. Deliverance from the second death at Smyrna. The new name written at Pergamos. The morning star to the Thyatirans. White raiment to the church at Sardis. The new Jerusalem to the Philadelphians. And now a sharing of his throne at Laodicea. All these promises that Jesus gave to these churches and they would come to pass. Then again, as he does in all of these letters, he gives a general exhortation to all whom will hear. He says again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The seven churches, or the seven epistles, these seven letters close with the seventh rehearsal of this exhortation. After, at the end of every letter, John mentions this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So such a sevenfold repetition, repetition of an identical commandment stresses its extreme importance. And it is vital that we read and heed these messages to the churches because the same problems that faced their, these churches, these seven churches in Asia that John wrote to, confront our churches and the same warnings and promises apply to us today as well as it did to them. Now in this last verse is the mention of the church in the book of Revelation until the last chapter where John's reminded that the entire book is to be sent to the churches. That's in Revelation 22, 16. Where John says this, Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Though there are no churches as such on earth during the climactic events of judgment described from Revelation 4 onwards. And so no reference to the churches appears in these chapters. The message of all the chapters, Revelation 1, 4, is for all of Christ's churches. However, and it is that message to which we will now proceed in our subsequent studies. He says this in Revelation 1, 4, 
John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So, next week, Lord willing, we shall begin to study the transition from the church age, which we are now in, I think we're at the close of it, the end of the church age, the transition from the church age then to the tribulation period, which will commence with the rapture of the church and the signing of the non-aggression treaty with the Antichrist and the Jewish nation. That's in Daniel uh, 9, 9, 6, I think. It's in the book of Daniel. It says, and the prince who was to come uh, makes this treaty with, with the nation of Israel, promising them peace and safety. So we shall begin next week then with the promise of his coming. Chapter four begins with a scene in heaven and it just goes from there. And this is gonna be a marvelous, marvelous study for all of us. All right, let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, take these precious words now. Apply them to our hearts and minds. Burn them into our hearts and minds, Lord. Help us to understand and to share these precious truths that you have given us here in this special book. So Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth and who gives us the, the wherewithal, the zeal to share our faith as Peter says, that we ought also to have an answer whenever we are asked about the faith that lies within us. So thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus. And uh, may your spirit enable us and empower us in the days and weeks to come until your return, we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. That's it for this week. So then this is Pastor Bob Mensinger saying goodbye for now. And we hope to see you here again next week, same time, same station, if the Lord should tarry. And in the meantime, keep looking up, keep encouraging and exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. All right, goodbye. Have a good week and God bless you. Amen. We'll see you next week.